Okay, uh, thanks everyone for joining. I feel a few minutes after two now, so I'm going to suggest we, that we kick off. So thanks for joining today's um, Tommy Flowers Network Thought Leadership event. Um, really pleased today that our speaker is Chris Golding. Chris is a postgraduate researcher at the Durham University Business School, and his interest is in, um, in management and strategy around innovation, and in particular the role that innovation at uh, the emotion might play in that process. Um, so he's just been completing his PhD, and he's going to talk to us about the, the research that he's been doing as part of that. And just in case you think that will be a full time job in itself, Chris is also a bit of a demon hockey player and next year is planning to cycle from Land's End to John O'Groats. So, Chris, over to you. Just actually, sorry, before we do start, can I ask that everyone stays on mute and we will have some time for Q&A at the end, um, which will use the um, raise hand function, which is um, within Teams, or you can put a question into the chat. OK, thank you. And Chris, over to you. Perfect. Um, thanks for that introduction, Carol. Um, Yep, so I'm Chris and today I'm really excited to talk to you about kind of the role that emotion can play in the innovation process, which is something that I've been exploring for the last few years as part of my uh, doctoral research at Durham University Business School. And um, so kind of what I want to do today is take us through um, the basic psychology of what emotions are, okay, and then consider that knowledge in terms of the innovation process. So does emotion really matter for the innovation process? Um, but my disclaimer here is I'm gonna obviously say yes, um, but hopefully I can convince you guys um, to maybe think about emotion in a slightly different way um, with a view to then giving you some practical recommendations and strategies and some time for some Q and A at the end, like Carol has alluded to. So um, some quick background on myself. Um, I'm a postgraduate researcher, which is just um, fancy terminology for saying a PhD student. Um, I'm currently in the really late stages of writing up and I'm hoping to submit my thesis at the end of next month, all things provided. So very exciting time for me. And um, what my thesis looks at is how emotion is able to affect the innovation process in large established incumbent organisations. And I'm particularly interested in kind of high technology organisations. So what my interests really are in is kind of the issues of strategic management and in order to understand these and how people overcome them to draw on stuff that we know from social psychology to kind of shed some new insight. So emotion, what is it? Well, if I wanted to give you a really fancy answer, we would say that emotions are psychophysiological states. OK, so all that means is that emotions involve physical and psychological adaptations in human beings. So. A very simple way to conceptualize them is feeling states with an identified cause or target. So emotions are always directed towards a specific eliciting stimulus or target. And the reason that we have emotions um, actually kind of if, if we take it back is that humans obviously have to adapt to survive. And through natural selection, emotions have developed as kind of a class of solutions which allow us to adapt to our environment without us necessarily having to think about it. So for example, if um, we suddenly feel scared, we know that something isn't quite right, we may be under threat, there's a danger that we might need to avoid or act upon in our environment, and that's not gonna be good for our personal goals or our well-being. So um, very quickly, um, I just wanna differentiate between emotions and moods. So what we're speaking about today is specifically emotion. So that is something which is a very intense and short lived experience and it's got a very clear eliciting stimulus, whereas a mood is something which is a bit longer, it's more diffuse and more often than not, it's quite difficult to actually know what has caused the mood. These two things together are quite often referred to as affect, but specifically for today, um, like I said, we're focusing on emotion and that's what my research really explores. So. Um, positive and negative emotions. Now, when people say, you know, oh, it's a really positive emotion or it's a really negative emotion, what they really mean is it is pleasant or it is unpleasant in terms of how we experience it. So the difference between positive and negative emotions is that a positive emotion is meant to inform us that our environment is safe or that there are potential rewards or, or there's something in that environment which is conducive to our goals or our well-being. On the other hand, a negative emotion um, is designed to signal a danger or a threat in the environment. Now, what this does is it allows us to um, take certain courses of action and undergo certain adaptations in order to avoid coming to any harm. So fundamentally, negative emotions preserve our well-being 
as human actors. For this reason, a negative emotion will always trump a positive one. So this is why people think about kind of emotional climate within teams. If there are kind of if there's negativity spilling over into it, that can be very damaging. And we will go on a little bit further and unpack why that is the case. Um, but I would argue that there's no such thing as a good or a bad emotion. And this is something that I'll keep coming back to. Um, emotions are simply a source of information about how our environment might affect our goals or well-being. And depending on what their functionality is, will depict whether or not it is kind of good or bad per se. So if we think about the emotion process itself, um, we can kind of distill it into a ver variety of different stages. And this is always going to begin with an eliciting stimulus or the target of the emotion that I mentioned earlier. Having registered that stimulus and appraised it, um, we will start to experience a feeling state and we will undergo certain psychological and physical adaptations, depending on what that emotion is. Quite often we will express our emotions and there will be certain cues that we give as well. So for example, if someone is scared, we can quite often tell because the muscles in their face will have contracted in such a way to express fear. Now, this whole process can also be regulated. Um, and that is something, again, we will unpack a little bit later. So the perspective that I take on emotion is that it's intertwined with how we think, so our cognition. And fundamentally, um, the way this works is that whenever there is an eliciting stimulus, we will appraise what that means for our goals or our well-being, and that determines what emotion we are experiencing. So although there are a variety of different models of kind of how this appraisal occurs, and I mean, the appraisal theory um, literature is huge, um, this model by Richard Lazarus is a really nice and simple way to understand it. So when we are exposed to some sort of environmental stimulus, we make a primary and a secondary appraisal. Now, our primary appraisal initially asks the question, is this relevant to my goals or my well-being? Yes or no? If the answer is no, then we're not going to experience an emotion towards it because it doesn't matter. It's not consequential for us. If the answer is yes, then what we're starting to get interested in is, OK, so is this going to promote or is this going to uh, damage or threaten my goals and my well-being? So if the answer to that is yes, it promotes them, then we're going to experience a pleasant feeling or a positive emotion. And if the answer is no, then we're going to feel a negative emotion um, and, and feeling kind of, of unpleasantness. Well, when it comes to a secondary appraisal, this, this is pretty much what determines which specific type of positive and negative emotion we feel. And although there's plenty of contestation over exactly kind of how this occurs, um, there's pretty much three fundamental tenets which we think about. So can I psychologically cope with the situation? So an example of this might be um, if I think I'm going to fail my PhD um, and I consider myself only in terms of Chris as the PhD student, failure is fatal. However, if I think of myself as Chris, just the person, and the PhD is just a part of Chris as the person, you know, maybe I can see this as, well, you know, it's not the end of the world if I fail it because it's just part of life's rich tapestry. Um, equally, we might see if we can physically um, act on and change the situation at hand. And this might be through our own capabilities, our knowledge, our resources, or it might be through kind of resources, knowledge and capabilities that we can get access to through our network of people. Um, finally, we also think about whether or not that situation is going to change in the future. And this is something that humans are really quite good at in terms of we can make some broad guesses and anticipations about whether the situation at hand is going to change for better or for worse based on our prior experiences and our knowledge about that situation. So fundamentally, an appraisal is just um, how we determine whether our environment is conducive to our goals or our well-being. So it's in subjective um, interpretation. And that's really important because it means that the same uh, situation or stimulus can bring about two completely different emotional responses in people. Now, depending on the profile of appraisals that we make, um, we're going to experience slightly different emotions. So I've got a couple of examples here. Um, 
something like hope is obviously relevant to our goals or our well-being, but it's incongruent with them. However, when we come to that secondary appraisal with hope, we anticipate that the situation is likely to change in the future and it's going to change for the better. So there's this possibility of success and it encourages us to sustain commitment. Um, whereas if we were to experience something like fear, we know that the eliciting stimulus is relevant to our goals or our well-being. However, it's incongruent with them. So it, it's not good. And that therefore means that there's a threat in our environment and we might need to act on it. However, with fear, we have a low um, coping potential or potentially an uncertain one. And so we fear whether or not we are going to experience a threat or a harm. And it's very unclear whether or not we're going to be able to avoid it. And this can result in certain different tendencies, whether we actually engage with that situation, try and act upon it and ameliorate the threats, or whether we just completely disengage from that situation and try and avoid that threat altogether. Now, obviously, when we come on to talk about innovation, this can be quite, quite consequential for how effective innovation can be. So as the consequence of our appraisals, we're going to experience feelings, which is what we would conventionally think of as as an emotion. You know, we feel happiness, we feel fear or whatever. And um, there's going to be mental and physical adaptations and we might physically be able to express um, our kind of emotion from this. So just as a, as a bit of an example here, um, a man is out and he sees a bear on his walk. So he obviously sees the bear and he appraises his situation. So is this relevant for my well-being? Yes, because this bear looks quite hungry and is going to try and eat me. Is it congruent with my well-being? No, because I might perish. Um, what is my coping potential like in this? Well, I'm out for a walk. Um, I've only got a bottle of water with me, so I'm unlikely to be able to deal with a bear attacking me. So man experiences fear. The action tendencies associated with fear are kind of things that we can do to try and improve our fit with that environment. So in this situation, it might be running away from the bear, which probably isn't a great idea because they're really quick. Um, or it might be attacking the bear, which again, probably isn't a great idea because bears are particularly strong. However, we are going to undergo certain um, psychological and physiological adaptations, as I mentioned earlier, which can facilitate certain actions. So when we experience uh, fear, our pupils will dilate. And the purpose of this is to allow us to take in more information from our environment to help us arrive at a decision on what to do. Similarly, we, our bodies are going to secrete cortisol and adrenaline and our heart rate is going to increase because that's going to allow us to take some form of action. And like I said, we might physically express fear. Now, psychologically, um, and this is quite commonplace with a negative emotion, is it narrows or it reduces our attention. On and, and, and this is designed to try and help us focus on and understand what the stimulus is, what the nature of the threat is, in order for us to act upon it. Now, with fear as well, it can make us put the short term over the long term. So an example of this might be, for example, if my supervisor rings me up and says, where's this piece of work you promised to give me? Now, if I haven't done this piece of work, I might be scared of my supervisor, I might not want to be told off. And so I might say, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, it, it, it's going to be with you in 15 minutes. I'm just out on a walk. I need to email it to you. Now, what that does is that preserves my well-being in the short term because they then say okay and put the phone down but in the long term that's not official for me and so in this way we can see how emotions can um, perhaps cloud our judgment and although the immediate outcome might be beneficial the longer term outcome can actually be kind of detrimental we are also able to regulate our emotions so all emotion regulation is, is our attempt as human beings to influence what emotions we experience. And the key thing with this is that they're goal focused. So if I'm feeling sad and I decide that I want to feel less sad, that is going to, well, I might choose an alternative course of action than if my goal is to be happy, for example. So the goal of kind of emotion regulation is really important. Emotion regulation can involve um, regulating our own emotions. So that's what we would refer to as intrinsic regulation. Um, and that's kind of quite commonly what has been uh, explored within the management literature so far um, or someone else's. And this is something which 
people have used to explore the dynamic between, you know, teachers and children, parents and children, when they're trying to calm them down, when they're upset or whatever. And equally, we might want to downregulate or upregulate an emotion. So in a certain situation, we might wish to downregulate the level of fear we have, perhaps about taking um, a new job opportunity and upregulate our excitement about what, um, what possibilities that's introducing for us. But I will come on and unpack emotion regulation a little bit later on. Now, emotion is an individual level phenomenon, so we experience it as individuals. However, um, what we do know is that emotions can become shared in groups of people. And this is obviously very consequential for contemporary businesses because of the interdependent and team based nature um, of which you know, large businesses tend to go about doing their business. The way in which this generally occurs is either through interaction with people and we know from research that people tend to mimic the people they're around. So that whole idea that you are kind of the output of the six people that you spend the most time around or kind of whatever that saying is, is because we can consciously and unconsciously share our emotions, our feelings and whatnot with one another. And therefore, teams typically will demonstrate very similar emotions under these auspices. Now, being a member of a team can also lead to similar emotions through identification with that team. Now, rather than being or rather than interacting with people within the same team, so let's say that we're, me we're all members of um, a research division which is trying to commercialise technology X. So our goal is to commercialize this technology. And therefore, when we interpret environmental information, we're interpreting it in terms of the goal to commercialize this technology. Accordingly, we're gonna pay attention to similar forms of information and we're gonna make similar appraisals of it. And this is gonna result in us experiencing similar emotions. And as a result, positive and negative emotions and their effects can be very much amplified in team-based environments. So just to distinguish and make sure we're clear on what I'm saying, a group based emotion is about identification or membership with a group. So an example um, might be, for example, that BT employees felt pride when BT Sport and kind of the TV channels were launched. It was a brilliant thing. It's a similar reason why Americans feel patriotic on the 4th of July, because they interpret all these great things that it means to be American. On the other hand, a group shared emotion needs physical co-presence, um, synchronised attention onto the same stimulus and quite often interaction. And a good example of a group shared emotion might be at a concert, for example, when the lights dim and the music goes down and we know that the performer's about to come on, the excitement levels kind of ripple through the audience and everyone um, is obviously looking forward to that person getting on stage and performing. So just to put some boundary conditions on my own research and so people can understand kind of where I'm coming from. Um, the reason that innovation is, is really important is basically because the survival and prosperity of, of most organisations depends upon it, the ability to consistently adapt and change to the environment. And this is quite often the basis in which organisations can compete with and outcompete their competitors. Now, innovation is a little bit complex because it's multidimensional in that we might be talking about innovation as a process. So the, the invention, development and new and implementation of new ideas. And we also might be talking about innovation as kind of an outcome or an output. So this idea of incremental innovations versus radical innovations and incremental innovation building on our existing knowledge, resources and capabilities, whereas a radical innovation is something completely new and departs from this. So it builds some completely new knowledge, resources and capabilities. And I'll come back to that a little bit later because it's quite, con because it's quite consequential. Now, just some food for thought about emotion and innovation. So we know that innovation is premised on exploration of new and un unknown domains. OK, and so there is um, an air of uncertainty about innovation and whether or not it will be successful. So bearing in mind, we know that fear is it can be elicited by uncertainty. That seems as though fear is going to be potentially experienced in the innovation process. Um, we know that at different stages of the innovation process, we've got different requirements. So, for example, at the start, when we're generating new ideas, we need lots of excitement 
um, and commitment just to get basic ideas off the ground and kind of into that innovation funnel and innovation process. As I've alluded to, um, emotions can become shared amongst groups and teams and can be quite consequential for how they feel and how they act and how they behave. And so therefore emotion is likely um, to have amplified effects in contemporary organizational innovation, which presupposes collaboration and team-based working. And as I mentioned, not only is innovation uncertain, but its outcomes are consequential. So new innovations or technologies which might be adopted um, could be brilliant for some parts of the organization, but it might also leave other individuals or, or roles or teams even redundant. And so therefore there can be this tension which we need to consider and address. So does, does it really matter? OK, um, yeah, in, in my opinion, it really does. And this is why. So if we have a negative emotion um, drawing from the research on psychology, the idea is that it will typically, I'm not saying it always is, but just for this, this case in point, um, motivate avoidance tendencies. So it will encourage us to withdraw from the situation or just avoid it altogether. It will narrow our attention so that we can identify what the threat is. And in order to try and resolve that, we will be limited to local search because this is the most effective way for us to find some sort of solution. Negative emotions like fear can also bias our perceptions of risk and probability as well. So it can make things seem more or less likely. On the other hand, Positive emotions like joy, which are kind of like synonymous with happiness, can encourage us to approach and engage with our environments because obviously they're signaling us, signaling to us that these environments are rewarding and safe. And so as a result, we broaden our attention and our action repertoires and um, we can explore more distant domains. OK, and so this might allow us to discover new things which are useful for innovation and generally sustain motivation. So at a very basic level, you're probably sat there thinking, OK, so what you're saying, Chris, is let's get rid of negative emotions because they're going to prevent innovation from happening and promote positive innovation emotions because that's going to help innovation. It's not quite as straightforward as that. And I just want to give a case in point with Nokia. So we're all probably very familiar with Nokia, um, a massive technology organisation who were once at the kind of very forefront of the mobile phone market. However, when smartphones came about, they kind of fell away um, in light of Apple's iPhone and Samsung's Galaxy or whatever the early incarnations were called. Now, um, there's a very interesting study on this, which suggested the reason for this was due to the experience of fear within the organization. So top management at Nokia were renowned for being um, scary physically, shouting, um, pummeling the table, throwing things around the boardroom, screaming at people. And as a consequence, middle management at Nokia never really wanted to disappoint them. And so whilst top management were putting pressure on them to deliver the first smartphone for Nokia, middle managers were not being particularly liberal with the truth. In fact, they were agreeing to deadlines which they knew they couldn't meet. They kind of let them believe that the technology would actually be able to compete with Samsung and Apple, even though, even though they knew it wouldn't be. And fundamentally, fear led to a breakdown of the communication channels between middle and top management, resulting in top management making really inappropriate decisions. Um, obviously, they were the best decisions that they thought they could make, given the information they had available. But this information was biased and inaccurate. And as we know, the rest is history. Um, I think, in fact, in the last five years, Nokia's mobile phone division has, in fact, been divested off to Microsoft, whereas we know that Apple and Samsung are still battling it out. So this just kind of highlights how emotions um, experienced at various levels of management can actually be very consequential for organisational level outcomes. And it's why we still need to have a better understanding of how emotion can affect the innovation process. Now, um, fear of failure is something that I found within my own research. Now, Rather than saying that fear is not good for innovation, I've actually found that this is quite positive. So when I refer to fear of failure, it's a temporary state which we experience due to the imagined diversive consequences of failing in a task. Um, conventionally, it's been explored in entrepreneurship, but I've looked at it obviously in a more contemporary innovation context. And what I found has been very interesting. So fear of failure actually has the capacity to both 
motivate and prevent action. Okay, it's not just going to force people to disengage. And in large parts, this comes down to what the source of fear of failure is. And that's something that I'll expand on a little bit later if we've got time. I've also found that fear of failure varies between people in positions of the hierarchy. So top management um, is generally predisposed to more external sources of fear of failure. So things around the potential of the ideas being pursued or kind of whether or not they're going to have sufficient funding for the department or for the organization. Now, middle managers and operational managers, on the other hand, are much more concerned with the individual level because obviously their role is to try and translate strategic visions into a reality. And what this means is that they will be motivated to act by concerns about um, whether or not they'll be upsetting significant others in their lives. Okay, so maybe that's kind of their line manager or the person that oversees that division if they've got some sort of relationship with them, which is quite interesting. So whereas at Nokia, fear um, very much constrained the innovation process, I found very much the opposite in terms of fear can actually facilitate it. And the reason for that is that whilst fear does narrow our attention and it does limit what actions we might be able to take, it is really useful at identifying threats to nascent innovations. Not only that, because humans want to resolve threats and dangers to perceived well-being, it also encourages organisational actors to act upon these things and to try and resolve them. So therefore, this can allow nascent innovations which, has their, which are experiencing certain threats to kind of have these shackles removed because managers have identified and acted upon them. Now, in this regard, um, I think a very common theme, um, particularly in my other life as a sports coach, um, but also within organisations is, you know, let's have this appetite for failure. And I know that people um, will cite kind of Google, you know, they're not afraid of failing and whatnot. And that's fine. That does decrease the experience of fear for organisational members. But given what my research suggests, this is not necessarily always going to be um, the most optimal outcome, okay? Because it might mean that we start to, to ignore threats or be pay less attention to them. And therefore, rather than resolving them, they're allowed to actually manifest and this can prevent innovation from actually occurring. So although fear is perhaps uh, an unpleasant and adverse state for us to experience, as managers and organisational actors, it can actually be a really valuable source of sensing and seizing capability. And what this also brings into kind of focus is the fact that we need to have managerial emotional capabilities, which is something that I will unpack again a bit later. And um, something else I discovered is that anticipated regret is quite often experienced in innovation. So regret is just the idea that I choose option A and then I later discover that option B was actually better and therefore I regret choosing option A because it was the less favourable course of action or outcome for me. Now because innovation is really uncertain one thing that managers do to try and overcome this uncertainty is imagine um, certain outcomes and how they would make them feel. So by imagining regret in the future we experience it in the present. Now, what this can do is actually um, motivate action to take place. So conventionally, um, it's thought that anticipated regret promotes the status quo. And the reason for this is that the regret associated with staying the same is less than the regret associated with pursuing some new course of action and it turning out to be a dud. However, when social comparisons are made, um, what this can do is it starts to make us think, oh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll miss out on this and I'll regret missing out. And so organisations tend to follow very similar courses of action and demonstrate homophily, which basically just means that they all kind of look and do very similar things. And whilst this can be dysfunctional, so for example, a small business sees Amazon doing something and tries to copy them, but it can't do that because it's not got the same business model as Amazon. When we are facing incumbent inertia, um, which is often something which prevents large organisations like BT potentially from innovating, it can 
provide sufficient impetus to managers to step into the unknown for fear that they might miss out on a desirable outcome, which perhaps their competitors are going to enjoy if, if, if you know, they don't take action. So this was a really interesting insight and it's something that I'm still digging into a little bit. Um, but what it does bring um, front and centre for me is the fact that making social comparisons is part of everyday life. We do it as individuals and we do it as organisations under kind of labels such as benchmarking. Now, it's really important that social comparisons are apposite. So you, who th that point of comparison isn't just... Um, superficially similar there are structural similarities between the two entities because otherwise it can either it, it can potentially promote a very dysfunctional course of action as i've kind of explained with the small company and amazon analogy now i've spoken a lot about negative innovations but one of my favorite findings from my own research is how awe is actually a really important emotion in the innovation process so um when i talk about awe um, or is a intensely positive emotion and it's experienced um, when we make two appraisals, two appraisals as um, individuals. So number one is perceptual vastness. So something is incredibly powerful. OK, maybe it has massive revenue potential. Maybe it just is physically massive, like uh, some sort of mountain or the Milky Way. Secondly, it comes about when the stimulus is just absolutely incomprehensible according to our existing understandings of the world. Now, quite often radical innovations um, share these two kind of characteristics because they depart massively from what we know knew beforehand. And so they kind of we have to go through some sort of cognitive change to understand them. And they also have really significant potential. It can be very profound and transformational. And so therefore it can elicit awe. Now, what I found um, is that awe can actually facilitate the early stages of innovation, particularly very radical and novel innovations, because it is a pro-social emotion. And what that means it is that individuals will put the group's well-being over their own. And it also builds really high levels of commitment to the group and to technologies. Now, as I'm sure everyone's aware, innovation is not a straightforward process and there's often many challenges along the way. If there are low levels of commitment, then it is quite likely that organisational actors might just give up at the first hurdle. However, if there are high levels of commitment, it, in, it encourages perseverance and perseverance is really, really important with radical innovations that we don't really know whether or not they're going to be successful until a long time down the line, as it were. Another element of this is the fact that awe has been shown to promote openness and acceptance, as well as facilitate cognitive change that I've just mentioned. Now, this is relevant because one of the major um, inhibitors of organisations being able to pursue particularly radical forms of innovation is that they go against maybe the organisation's identities or what's been gone before or what's known about. And so therefore, if awe can foster openness and acceptance, of potential change, then it seems more likely that we're actually going to be successful in bringing about change and innovation. And so for that reason, I would argue that we actually want to encourage and cultivate a sense of awe, particularly early in the innovation process, whilst we're trying to get these innovations off the ground. Just to take the idea of how positive emotions can facilitate innovation a little bit further, um, we're both prob we're, we're probably familiar with both Netflix and Blockbuster. So obviously Netflix is now a giant online digital media platform, which we all have got in our homes and our TVs, and Blockbuster is nowhere to be seen. Now, if we roll back 15, 20 years, Blockbuster were actually at the forefront of the industry where we could go and rent, you know, movies, TV shows, games. Um, and obviously we would rent them, have them for a period of time, we'd have to return them. Netflix had this similar sort of bricks and mortar model. However, their top managers foresaw an opportunity to adopt online, kind of an online platform to deliver this content to customers. And they framed it in a very emotionally engaging terms, um, suggesting that this was how they could, we could deliver maximum value to our customers or give them the best possible experience. And for that reason, it resonated with the employees at Netflix who were driven kind of to deliver on their, to their customers. 
and I encouraged them to accept this change, which they did, and they were successfully able to implement it. Blockbuster, on the other hand, had exactly the same opportunity. However, managers there kind of construed this idea that, you know, well, digital, digital online platform, that's not bricks and mortar. No, 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 that's not what we do. So they weren't able to position it in quite the same way. And as a result, they opted not to go through with it. And I guess the rest is history, ultimately. Netflix is an absolute behemoth and Blockbuster, like I said, is nowhere to be seen. And this just reinforces the importance of cultivating the appropriate emotions for certain aspects of innovation, whether that's adoption or pursuit. So some practical recommendations and strategies. Um, so number one, um, my suggestion would be that emotions are simply information about our fit with our environment. Therefore, we can use that to help inform and guide our decision making. It just seems a little bit short sighted to me, the fact that we have used emotions as humans to survive for many thousands of years, and yet we're willing to disregard it in the context of business over the notion of being irrational. If anything, to me, we should be harnessing this information. Yes, taking it and kind of critically analysing it for why we feel that way and whether or not it is um, kind of not valid. All emotions are valid because we experience them, but whether or not it is warranted. And then using that information to give us a more holistic decision. If anything, that's more rational because we're using more information to arrive at a decision. And here are just some ways in which we can think about it. So perhaps a new technology, um, we think it's a brilliant idea and it's definitely an opportunity. Now, is the reason that we think it's an opportunity because it excites us and it resonates with us? Equally, do we think it is a threat merely because it makes us uncomfortable and we don't really understand it? If we pay attention to our emotions, um, acknowledge them, recognise what the root cause of them is, then all it is is it's just more information with which we can actually make decisions. And this is very much based on um, a hypothesis called affect as information in which emotions are literally just constituted as information about the environment with which we can use to make decisions about how to behave. Following on from that is this notion of um, managerial emotional capabilities. So I'm sure people are familiar with kind of um, resources and, capa and capabilities being the basis of most organisations and competitive advantage. OK, but one thing which has been overlooked for a very long time is emotions as some sort of managerial capability. Now, if people can develop an understanding of what emotion is, how to regulate it both intrinsically for ourselves and, and extrinsically for our team members, then this can bring about the opportunity to elicit certain emotional states that might be able to facilitate innovation. So, for example, in the early stages of the innovation process, when we're just trying to generate lots of ideas to get into that innovation funnel, we're going to want um, a very positive atmosphere in order to be open and broad with our ideas, whereas at a later stage, we might want to be more critical. Now, managers who have good emotional capabilities might recognise which members of their team will be better suited to certain tasks. They might also understand kind of what triggers certain emotions in different individuals and therefore be able to work with these people to elicit the desired emotion at a given point in time in kind of following on the logic that emotion can inform how we think and how we behave. And this kind of leads into the third and final recommendation that I've got here. So um, as I mentioned earlier, emotion regulation is kind of our own way in which we can affect what emotions we experience. And there's a variety of different ways in which we can do it. So situation selection or modification, attentional deployment and cognitive change are three strategies we can use before we experience an emotion to influence what emotion we actually experience. Whereas response modulation is something we can do having experienced that emotion as a way to either upregulate it or downregulate it. So if we were thinking about situation selection, what we would do is we would consider what sort of environment or situation is going to elicit perhaps a positive emotion. So maybe um, 
there's talk about going for after work drinks with your team, but there's a team member that you really don't get along with and you know they're going to be there. So therefore, them being there could be a source of awkwardness or unpleasantness for us. So we might just choose to completely avoid that situation um, in order to avoid experiencing that sort of emotion. Um, similarly, with attentional deployment, we can put a focus on different aspects of situations and really emphasize those, um, knowing that those are going to elicit certain um, experiences for us. Similarly, cognitive change is a way in which we affect how we interpret the situation itself. So if we think about failure, going back to that example, perhaps we think about failure as fatal, or we can think, you know what, that's not very conducive to what I'm trying to do. And so maybe failure actually is just a really good learning opportunity. And even if I do fail, it's not a problem because I've managed to benefit from some really useful knowledge and experience that down the line, I can use in some other endeavor of mine. Now, when it comes to response modulation, so we've experienced that emotion and we want to kind of modulate it. The, 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 my favorite example of this would be um, parents who are, are online will be able to um, kind of recognize this. When a child has been naughty, um, it can often be quite amusing as an adult. However, in order to, for the child to learn that that is wrong, we have to um, not laugh and maybe put on an angry face or a stern face and explain to them why what they've done is wrong. So alternative responses to, um, or alternative ways in which we can modulate our responses might be we can suppress things so we can try and downregulate them. So, you know, my heart rate is absolutely flying, um, that's not because this talk that you're about to give is a threat, Chris. That's because your body is simply getting you ready to take action and, and give um, hopefully a really good talk to people. Um, equally, people might choose to just deny something's happening. OK, and um, I think we've all seen situations and said, you know, oh, that person's in denial. And that's literally because there's no, that's not happened and that prevents them from having to deal with and acknowledge the emotion that they might otherwise experience. Some quite common um, strategies which people often rely on are things like alcohol and um, smoking, kind of um, st eating different foods which make them feel better about situations. And these are all ways fundamentally in which we can alter what emotions we're experiencing. Now, as a general rule of thumb, we try and downregulate negative emotions because they're thought to have kind of detrimental effects. And we try and upregulate positive emotions. So that idea fundamentally is that we are promoting our goals and our well-being at all time. However, and um, linking back to my previous point about emotional managerial capabilities, it's important to understand how certain emotions can actually be beneficial in some situations and perhaps we might actually want to upregulate fear of failure at a certain stage of the innovation process in order to really help us advance and improve that technology or solution ready for it to actually be downstreamed. So a quick recap. Um, fundamentally, uh, just think of emotions as information about our fit with the environment. So it's just how we perceive our relationship with the environment. Is this a positive relationship or is it a negative one? Positive emotions signaling that it is a safe environment and that there are rewards to be had and negative emotions signaling dangers or threats. Emotions can very quickly become shared amongst group members and so therefore their effect might be amplified, which is why it's really important to pay attention to kind of the emotional climate of the teams that you might be involved in or are leading. And there's not really any such thing as a good or a bad emotion. Okay, it just simply depends on their functionality. And that the same emotion which is beneficial at one stage of the innovation process can actually be a real hindrance at a later stage. Going back to that example of a positive emotion being useful at the start, later on in the innovation process, it might lead us to um, experience confirmation bias. So we just look for information which kind of confirms what we already believe, or maybe to be overly optimistic. And that can actually be as much of a downfall with many innovations as being kind of neg overly negative towards them. Finally, 
Um, in my opinion, managerial emotional capabilities are one of the most overlooked areas for potential competitive advantage and really ought to be considered kind of front and front and foremost. Um, I think it's quite easy to look at someone uh, at, at, like a lot of organisations and even countries being led by females who, particularly in the UK, we're looking at going, geez, I actually wish we had them as our Prime Minister instead of Boris Johnson. Um, quite often because females have been shown just to be better at dealing with and regulating emotions. Um, and so that is something that I think people need to start taking more seriously. I think it is starting to be taken more seriously. But there's still a long way to go um, in terms of understanding what is going to bring about emotion and really thinking about how we can leverage emotions to elicit the desired behaviours for various stages of the innovation process. So um, these are just some recommended readings. Um, feel free to screenshot this. If you're going to go and read anything, read The Middle One by Mark Healy and Jared Hodgkinson. So they're two academics at Manchester University. Um, California Management Review is a practitioner oriented journal. And so there's far less kind of academic pontification in that. And they give some really, really awesome strategies for how to use emotions for, um, you know, for the benefit of your strategy and your innovation process. So, um, yeah, thank you for logging on and listening. I hope you found that interesting and useful. Um, I'm now happy to take any questions or if you feel that you'd rather do that offline or perhaps you've got somewhere to be, um, feel free to just reach out via email or via LinkedIn or whatever. And I'd be more than happy to speak to people on a one to one or a one to many basis. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris, for, for a really interesting talk. So just a quick reminder, if anyone's got any questions, you can either use the hands up function, which is in the sort of toolbar at the bottom of the Teams view, or you can um, put your question in the chat. Oh, I just got a question. Oh, no, that's just somebody who's joined the meeting. <laughs> Just, <laughs> just a reminder, so if anyone's got any questions, you can either use the chat function or you can use the hands up facility or as, um, as Chris mentioned, if you'd prefer to take it offline, then he's very happy to take emails. Um, of There's questions. Selena Carroll. Selena's oh, yeah, I have Hi, Selena, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's, it's amazing. I want to ask, obviously, as you, you already touched on, it's, it's considered or overlooked that you, you not in organizations that uh, emotions pr probably should not be shown or, you know, um, and if you, particularly for innovation, a lot of times is about instinct. And if you, you say that you feel this is the right way, often mm -hmm. you're, you're not really, again, overlooked, just as you said, you know, yeah. you're not really believed. So how do you think this can change, right? Um, I think it's a, it's a very much a cultural thing. So I, I think there is, and this is not meant to be uh, disrespectful in any way, shape or form, but is I think it's changing as um, the certain generations are coming into the workforce and people um, are generally just a little bit more accepting of and in, in touch with their emotions. Um, I, I don't really want to go down a rabbit hole on kind of um, mental health and whatnot, but the whole notion of, you know, it's OK to not be OK, it's OK to feel certain ways. Um, is really starting to bring this kind of more centrally in, into organisational conversations. Now, in terms of how we can step that further forward, I think it's just a case of, of, of education and over time it's going to begin to pervade organisational environments. Um, I think part, and uh, I'm more than happy to be challenging this, I think part of the reason that people um, perhaps, you know, aren't as um, aren't as comfortable talking and using emotions is because they don't necessarily understand them fully, um, and, and therefore it, there, there's a possibility, you know, we could look silly or, you know, we might not know what we're talking about. Someone might tell us we're wrong or laugh at us. And I think it's as more and more conversations are, are held in this regard, and people start to realise that emotion can be consequential for how we think and act, um, we're just going to get to a situation in which it is started to be regarded as, you know, a, just another conventional organisational capability. 
Um, I don't think there is um, a silver bullet. Um, it is my short answer to your question. I think that, however, there is more and more research showing that intuition, so that idea of kind of gut feeling as well as emotion, is a very useful way in which we can arrive at decisions quickly, but we just have to be aware of what biases they can potentially introduce. Thank you. Thanks, Selena, for your question. Are there any other? I can see a question from Laura Goldsmith. Laura, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Um, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Excellent. Um, yeah, I think um, I'm really interested. Um, I think it was an amazing, really inspiring um, what, you know, webinar. I'm really interested if you've come across organisations that you think have started to adopt this or do it well and coming back to your earlier point of of not trying to uh, mirror what other organizations do if you don't have the right structures in place do they have any shared characteristics so are there you know particular organizations that that do this well and what seem to be the reasons that they've maybe been able to adopt this well do they have any characteristics in common that maybe have made them more able to do that yeah um i think I think it's more just a general acceptance that, you know, you can talk openly about how you're feeling and, and, and not be judged. I don't think that at least I haven't yet come across an organisation who have got this down to a T. Um, I think the, I mean, in academia, it's been termed like the affective revolution. And we've only started to see people pay attention to this in the last five years, really. Um, so I think there's still a long way to go. What I do think is probably common about the organisations who do this better than others is that they've got a climate of psychological safety. So the idea that people can say, say things without it being judged and kind of held against them or basically thought as stupid. Um, that's kind of the, the point that I would make. Is, is it an environment where people feel safe to express their views and opinions without um, necessarily being judged. Um, it's no, never going to be perfect. Or are there at least mechanisms in which, you know, you can speak to someone, someone who's in a, some form of management position um, in order to, you know, I'm feeling this way about something. I think what would be really interesting specifically within um, an innovation project, and this isn't something that I've looked at or I've got evidence for per se, but it's something I've been thinking about in the lead up to this talk is when you're trying to make organizational decisions, are we asking people around that decision-making table, what do you think we should do? Okay, why do you think that? Yep, okay, how do you feel about it? And then starting to under, unpack individual feelings from different people and then kind of deep diving into that. And I know that this isn't always gonna be possible, but with some big organizational decisions, you're taking time and effort anyway. So, um, yeah, can we dive into those and start to understand why each individual is feeling as they are and then use that to inform what final decision we go to? Um, I would, yeah, I, I don't have anyone out there who I would point towards and say these people are doing it brilliantly. Um, I, again, I would probably fire out that teams with female leaders might do this better. That's what the research would indicate, but that's not to say males can't do it effectively as well. Um, but I definitely can see um, certain semblance between British response to coronavirus in New Zealand, for example, um, where one leader is perhaps a little bit more adept at regulating emotions than the other. So sorry if I haven't given you a, a, quite a perfect answer. It's a, I think it's a little bit of an uncertain area still. Yeah, thank you. No, it's really interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks for your question, Laura. And I think we've got another question from Tonya Alcock. Are you there, Tanya, or are you on mute? You're on mute. Hi, yes, yeah, sorry about that. Technology fails me every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm really interested in what you were saying about, obviously, the pro-social part is sort of emotion, um, awesome, but also I'm just, it makes me think about the current situation we're working in at the moment with COVID. We're all working from home. So a lot of our stimulus on how people are feeling is absent. Yeah. In a way, we're almost in a vacuum for a lot of us. I mean, I know some we're doing a lot of video calls, but um, I've just been involved in some research interviewing people who are home working and the managers 
they often you know you take so much from that when you ask someone are they okay mm-hmm. you don't almost have to listen to what they say yeah um, so they're all having to work a bit harder and I just wondered if you had any thoughts on this current COVID situation and the fact that we're all working from home so I think um it is obviously related to emotion, but a fundamental human need is that need to belong. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the need to belong to a team. And that's why we see um, people conform to maybe social norms that they wouldn't otherwise do mm-hmm. because they want to be a part of a of a certain group. Now, by working at home, we've kind of lost that physical connection to it. And I just you can do as many zoom calls and everything as you like and so obviously as a phd we haven't been in offices but i've been trying to have um kind of regular coffee calls with various people that i'd go and brainstorm with um and it it just it doesn't have the the same effect is there an answer to it i unfortunately i I don't someone might be out there but there is just something about that that face-to-face and physical interaction with people at the end of the day um, and it's, it's related to awe so if we would go back however many years and um, primordial awe was actually designed or the purpose of primordial awe was to essentially facilitate groups to work together because obviously an individual human is less capable of you know surviving and bringing food back for the tribe than 15 working together and in that regard i think that just shows that whole idea that people are designed to work together in close physical proximity to one another and i don't that's never going to change it's just a basic human need um yeah i i don't think there is an answer to it i think we do need to get people back into and i'm not saying that we need to get them back any quicker than we're currently doing so people need that physical interaction in in some way, shape or form, whether that means that we get people back working just one day a week, so be it. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's going to give that sense of connection and that sense of belonging and the kind of positive emotions associated with that, which I think are are really important, as you pointed out. Um, I haven't seen a great deal, and obviously because COVID's only been quite recent in terms of how we can deal with that, but what I would direct you towards, this is a really good article on Harvard Business Review, and it's free by a guy called Siegel Bassard. So B-A-R-S-A-D-E. Uh, contagion, emotional contagion. Yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've seen yeah he's released, I don't know if you've seen it, a recent piece on HBR, mm-hmm. uh, kind of about emotional contagion and its consequences. And I think he offers some suggestions at the tail end of the article about how he might be able to address those as well. So that might well be worth having a look at. But if you want, I'm more than happy to go away and have a look and get back to you on that. Um, please, and, and maybe have a chat separately as well, because this very much aligns to a lot of my own research on morale and that emotional contagion. So, yeah, that would be great, please. Perfect. Cool. Sorry, Carol, go on. I've hogged the argument. I don't know whether we've lost Carol, actually. We've got Joseph Spear from Envine. If you like Sorry, to I had a mute there. Apologies. All right. <laughs> Joseph, did you want to ask your question? You're on mute. Let's see if I can. Hi, is this Joseph? Hello. Christopher, hi. I'm just on the video for you. Yep, perfect. Uh, um, a fascinating study that you've uh, conducted. Uh, I wish you all the best with your Viva. Thank you. Uh, you look like uh, you're on your way to a distinction, if you ask me, but there you go. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> a few, fewer corrections, the better, right? Yes, absolutely. So um, my question is really from the point of view of people who work in um, media and communications profession. Yeah. Um, we work a lot uh, with a variety of different people, and we need to create outbound messaging to a whole raft of different types of people yeah. who occupy different job roles. Mm-hmm. So uh, we can... Uh, normally um, categorize them either as emotional responders or as logical responders. And let me just unpack that a little bit. Uh, Depending on how they're wired, uh, technologists, for example, do tend to make decisions based on the logical rather than the emotional. Yeah. So hot and cold, as it were. Yeah. Uh, That's why uh, technologists don't tend to respond terribly well to what they would call as marketing fluff. 
Mm -hmm. They just they just want the basic information yeah. uh, presented in the, the least fuss possible. So what advice would you offer to people who work in media and communications about mm -hmm. emotion? Thank so, you. Um, as, as a kind of a segue into this, I'll share another insight from my own research. Um, and that was that in order to facilitate innovation, um, an effective way to do so and to convince people um, who are kind of logical and maybe less emotional is through the use of emotion of aspirations. So when we think of an aspiration, it's kind of some sort of future or desirable future state. And what we can do, or you can use aspirations in a way that you can be aligned to both kind of the cold um, or those kind of more objective statistics, as well as the hot, so triggering those emotional responses. So I think it's kind of a nice segue into which which balances between cognition and emotion. Um, so what I noticed was that by articulating how the pursuit of a technology was aligned with certain aspirations, um, it not only managed to appeal to those who are, you know, basically that they, they tick thanks to numbers, but it also kind of got them sufficiently emotionally invested that they then started to see things as an opportunity. And then when you compared that to what other people were doing, they go, geez, there's actually a threat to this opportunity. I need to act on it. And, and they kind of got this weird mixture of anticipated regret and, and tinged with fear. And it really motivated action. And I think I'd, I'd been watching interactions for 16 months at this point and not a lot had happened. And then in the space of six months, I was seeing a lot of movement. So I think aspirations are a, a really interesting concept because it, as humans, we quite often imagine the future to make a decision in the present. And I mean, if you can tell someone it's going to hit their aspirations in some sort of way, that's always going to trigger a positive emotional response. And that's likely going to encourage them. Or if we say, if you don't do this, it might threaten your aspirations, then that can be kind of a bit subversive, but might also work. So I think that there would be, it is finding some sort of suitable bridging mechanism. The only one that I can offer off the top of my head, and I'd be more than happy to get back to you, um, having thought about it a little bit more, would be some for something emotionally engaging like an aspiration and um, i think that's and there's, there's not a great deal of research on them um, but i think that's a really useful way that you communicate an ex how an expected course of action might pan out and encourage people to evaluate something in a certain way or, or allocate resources in a certain way in light of what it could achieve so kind of the power of the future i think is always going to be very um very effective in terms of bringing these sorts of things about at the end of the day like you said some people are just wired differently so um, i've not gone into different trait states with with emotions fear of failure is a classic one some people are predisposed to experience fear more than others because they have lower tolerances of uncertainty and um, there's nothing they can really do about that other than try and regulate the emotion so yeah again sorry if it's not a, a, a perfect answer but i think that's the best i can do but if again like i said i'm more than happy to chat to you offline about this perhaps having had a bit of time to think and prepare some answers for you i think uh, christopher that's a tremendous answer a very well informed answer if in the course of your literature review you have any uh, go-to people uh, who have written about aspirations i'll be very interested to know more about that yeah perfect let's let's connect offline and i'll um, sure. send some stuff your way Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation today. No, thank you. Thanks, Joseph. I think we've got one more question here from Richard Parsons. Chris, if, okay. Richard, would you like to go ahead? Hi, Chris. Um, thanks for the um, presentation. It was excellent. Um, an observation from me and, and really a question. Um, you talked about the basic need of belong, belonging to a team. Well, BT, I think, are moving towards... Uh, we, we're moving towards um, a, a, a concept called agile delivery, and as as part of that, it, there's more co-location, um, collaboration, face to face. So they're wanting people to actually 
meet on a more regular basis in order to deliver more quickly and certainly from a technological um, perspective so that kind of um, rang true for me really but um, a, a question uh, really uh, so you've mentioned the p word a few times which is perfect do yeah. you think organizations should be embracing imperfection more um, yeah i think i mean yeah per perfect is probably uh, something which either ne never happens or maybe happens once in a blue moon isn't it if we're really honest um i know that i've been told on so many occasions recently remember your thesis isn't meant to be perfect it's not going to be perfect um but it, it's quite difficult like we we always want to strive for perfection i think that's just a, a, a basic and intrinsic human motive at the end of the day so yeah i do think um what what my kind of research particularly in the fear of failure domain seems to suggest is that um whereas historically people the idea of fear of failure was about like just complete and utter failure we can almost experience micro doses of it so just in tasks which we think are important to a specific outcome so at bt it might be a project level outcome rather than you know, if this fails, the whole company's going under. Yeah, I definitely think there should be acceptance that, you know, failure isn't fatal or imperfection is is, is fine. Um, I guess leading into minimal viable product sort of notions that yeah. it's better to get something out there and iterate it than it is trying to fit to create something which you think is perfect and then sending it out and actually discovering it's not what customers want. So in, in that guise, I think, yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Imperfection should be accepted, accepted, encouraged almost. But I still think that there is place to be encouraging people to to go for that almost the unattainable. Um, yeah. So so you can strive for excellence, but you don't really have to strive for perfection. Yeah. yeah? So they're two very different things, I think. Yeah, I, th I think if you can differentiate between that in people's minds, that's a really key thing. Um, recognizing that there's also different levels of failure, I think, is where this would come down or, or shortcoming or however you want. To, I mean, failure, words like failure and rejection, I found, has a bit of a triggering property with people and it, it makes people very uncomfortable and, and, and whatnot. Um, but at the end of the day, if you fail from something and you don't or there's a there's a great piece by um, a guy called Owen Daniel was in something Vestal it escapes me but they were discussing the principle of fear of failure and this whole normalizing of it so the idea of normalizing basically is what we're talking about you know it doesn't matter if you fail necessarily it's acceptable it's part of the journey but just doing that means that we're not going to learn anything from it what we need to do is we need to analyze our shortcomings or our failures and learn from it so next time perhaps we don't make the same mistakes and we arrive at a you know, a, a more optimal or more desirable outcome. I think that's where big organizations still fall down. And I think the reason for doing so is because uh, the, there's a psychological name for it. It's called the ostrich effect. So basically we bury our head in the sand from disconfirming or painful information, which goes against what we believe to be true. People need to overcome that because otherwise you're just going to make the same mistakes over and over again. Um, so I think that they're, it needs an effective mechanism might be you know the debrief and it's what was uh what was our biggest failure within this and why did it happen and you know sometimes it's unavoidable sometimes we just you know made a poor decision and we can take that knowledge and then try and use it next time oh yeah like we we cocked this up last time but we realized if we did it this way instead it might actually be be more successful and if it fails again then we just keep learning from it um, so I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly agree with you. I think um, f what I would think of as failure isn't fatal, but you know, failure is a very good indicator and uh, of what we can do better for next time. And so we can only really learn from it at the end of the day. Um, if you ignore it, then you're probably just, you're destined to make the same mistake twice, aren't you? And history is just yeah. going to repeat itself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just how accepting or how people understand you know failure isn't great but you know it is a learning opportunity it doesn't necessarily 
necessarily mean that I'm useless at my job. It doesn't undermine my self-worth or whatever. Um, can lessen the impact of it. It's still going to hurt. It still should, because it indicates that you know we haven't achieved our goal. But at least let's get take some sort of positive out of that if we can in some sort of paradoxical way. Yeah, thanks. That's a good insight. But I think that um, failure and imperfection are maybe two different things, I guess, um, it, it, because you can succeed without being perfect. Failure, I don't know, it, it just brings visions of complete failure and disaster. But Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. OK, I, I appreciate that point, but I think there that's a, a perfect illustration of what we were, I was just saying about failure is obviously tinged to mean, you know, failure is fatal whereas we can fail in in small versions of tasks and we can yes. fail in to a very small extent and still succeed as it were yes yeah. so, um all it might mean is that we just haven't quite hit the lofty standard we've set um, and yeah. i think that's a really big thing that we can try and learn from and try and change kind of as as we move forward in contemporary business yeah. is that let's accept failure isn't some sort of taboo word like it's just part of everyday life you if you got everything correct the first time life would be really boring wouldn't it yeah so <laughs> can we actually look at this in terms of all right well i didn't do brilliantly on that opportunity but that opportunity will probably come again and i'm going to do better because i've now got that experience from last time yes um, i think that's where i was going with the kind of imperfection to me there's that's like a micro failure yeah uh, so yeah certainly I, I wholeheartedly agree with you i think very few owners i mean apple are notorious for trying to be close to perfection um, they look as though they're doing fine since steve jobs sadly passed as well and the, his replacement isn't anywhere near as hard a taskmaster so um yeah i think if, if we can learn anything from the case of apple you know that's imperfection is fine just yeah we can do better next time yeah and I think Google, just um, just to finish, Google are good at imperfection because they're always releasing beta versions of software, um, this, that, and the other. And and really, I've always admired them for that. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll caveat this: there are certain instances where failure actually could be fatal. So, for example, if you say, you know, oh, it's okay if the, the core network, if this new innovation, is oh, yeah. to it, like that's probably not great for a company like BT. Um, <laughs> there's there's a spectrum of of maybe how important things are or how critical they are to delivering yes. this proposition uh, where we've got to be more or less certain, but I think that's the case with anything. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Great. Thank you guys for all of your questions. That's been a really interesting discussion, but I'm, I'm conscious that now that we, that we are well over time. So I just want to say a big thank you again, Chris, for sharing your um, talk with us today and we will I've had a few questions on slides and recording we will make those available to the participants after the call and I think Chris you're you're very happy for people to contact you if, if they want to discuss things directly yeah absolutely more than happy to chat offline fantastic well thank you very much again and, and good luck with getting that thesis written up yeah thank you for having me guys thanks Chris bye-bye thanks